My soul magnifies the And I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. We left off last week asking the question from Hebrews chapter 2. Is there now a man anywhere in the exalted place for which God actually created mankind? Is there anyone worthy? And the Hebrew writer leaves no doubt. We do see one such man, and his name is Jesus. And he is crowned with glory. He is crowned with honor. And as Revelation 5, verse 5 says, And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. That's what Hebrews is all about. Reminding us that the Christ that we serve is worthy. And if those songs that we just sang don't move you, you need to check your pulse. Because we serve an amazingly worthy God. And we come together tonight to remember that and to celebrate that and to focus on that and to grow in the knowledge of that worth that Jesus offers to us. The eternal Son who was God's agent in creation. He's the one that spoke it all into existence. And the one who shares God's nature became a human being. He became a man. And for a little while... He was lower than the angels themselves. And as a man, he lived and he died for us. And he lived and he died in our place. In the process, he destroyed the devil. He frees humankind from death's binding fear. 
And God raises the worthy Jesus from the dead and exalts him to a position far above all angels, even at his own right hand. Now perfected, Jesus stands as high priest through suffering and helps his brothers and sisters who also suffer. And that is what the author talks about in the last half of chapter 2. I want you to see if you can pick out these themes as we begin reading in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. Here's what it says. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, names him for the first time, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Underline those words if you do that in your Bible. Perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I give, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore, verse 14, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same thing, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. If we search the whole world over, we cannot find any human being who exercises sovereignty over God's creation. But if we look beyond the present earth, we get a different view. A a completely different picture arises. There we do see one man crowned with glory, crowned with honor, Jesus Christ. And Jesus' death demonstrate at the, at the elevated level the heights of human cruelty and human evil. But even more, the cross was not just, a, it was not just a, an act of human cruelty and, and evil. Even more than that, it was an act of divine grace. God took that which was so evil and so wicked, and he actually used it to be the source of his grace. Only God is able to do things like that. Only God is able to make that happen. Jesus experienced death, not for himself, but for all of us. And he experienced that not in some vague way, not in some general way, but specifically, he suffered death for your sin and for my sin. Jesus' death for all men is described further in verse 17, where we learn that Jesus made propitiation for his people's sin. What in the world is propitiation? That's one of those big churchy words that we don't use outside the four walls of a church building. What in the world is propitiation? Well, the Greek word is from the is a form of the verb that describes a sin offering. Okay, well, what in the world is that? We're not in Leviticus tonight, Steve. What is a sin offering? What does that have to do with anything? What, what in the world are you talking about? What does that even mean? Well, here's what it means, and I need you to get this tonight. You're never going to understand how worthy Christ is if we don't understand this very thought first. Jesus dies as our representative, just as he lived as our representative. And by his perfect living and his perfect dying, Jesus takes our place. He stands in our stead. He experiences life and he experiences death and he bears our nature and he wears our names on that cross. And what he does when he raises from the grave is he makes us whole again with God. That is propitiation. That is the sin offering that Hebrews lays at our feet and says, do you see what an amazing God we have? Do you see how amazing Jesus is? Jesus represented us on earth in order to represent us in heaven. 
It's an amazing, amazing thing. By his perfect living and dying, he did all of that. The Son of God, who was always higher than the angels, became a man. And although he would never abandon his deity, he also, having taken on our nature, would never abandon his humanity. And so when Jesus has done everything that God ever desired for a human being to do by his life and by his death, God raises him from the dead and exalts him to his right hand in heaven. And so now, right now at this moment, in the presence of God, he is still the Son. He is also Jesus. Always divine, he is also now human. Forever perfect in essence. Forever perfect in character. He is now perfected through suffering to be the high priest for us who he came to save. Wow. It blows me away every time I read these words in Hebrews. It blows me away that he is mindful of us. Just like David said in Hebrews 2 earlier, what are we that you even care about us? It's incredible. Let's look a little closer at this phrase, perfected through suffering, because I think this is big. This is, to me, a very scary phrase. And it's scary for a variety of reasons, because what I think it means, if I understand it correctly, is that if we're ever going to be complete, perfected or made complete really is the is the idea behind the world with the word if we're ever going to be that that means suffering is going to have to come into each and every life and so to me this is a very sobering thought in fact it was jesus who said remember that a servant is not above his master no if they if they hated the master rest assured that if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing they're going to hate you too and suffering is going to be a part of this process to complete us, to, to perfect us, to make us whole, if you will, uh, uh, for God's purposes. And so if Jesus was to accomplish salvation, he had to be perfected. He had to be made complete, if you will, uh, by experiencing suffering. And, and what the Hebrew writer does is he takes this, this high priest consecration. Before a priest ever offered a sacrifice, they had to be consecrated first, set apart. Well, that's what Jesus does through suffering. That's what Jesus does through suffering. Just as priests were perfected, quote-unquote, uh, Jesus has suffered all that his people suffer except sin itself. And because of that, he became the origin. He became the source of our salvation. And I want you to think about this. Jesus has suffered as one of us. He's one of us. He's one of us. He didn't use his divine power to avoid temptation, to avoid hardship, to avoid suffering. He didn't use his, his, his divine power to skirt around uh, any of those things that we all want to avoid at all costs in our life. No. I mean, this is what Satan tempted him to do in Matthew 4. He said, you don't have to go through the suffering. Just bow down to me and I'll give you all of this. And Jesus says, are you kidding me? I don't live by your words. I live by, by the words of God. And so instead of using his divine power to, to grant him the things that we could only hope for, he looked it in the face and he walked into it for us and with us. You see, what we needed was someone who could enter into the overgrown terrain of our world and clear a path for us. A path that could be created from, from us to God. And the only way that could happen was for God himself to make it, make it happen. And that's exactly what Jesus came to do. He came machete in hand, clearing the path so that we could get back to God. That's the image that we're given. And these truths are so critical, but they also, to me, serve as a warning. A very important warning. What Jesus did in clearing the path for us means that he is the only one who gets to set the terms, if you will. The terms were determined according to the mind of God, not to us, not our minds. We, we don't get to decide how we're going to get there. He says, I've cleared a path, and if you want to get to God, you've got to go down that path. And the point is not that Jesus is an appropriate trailblazer. No. The point of Hebrews is that he is the only appropriate trailblazer. The only one we can follow 
and end up where we're supposed to be. I was having a conversation with a guy not too long ago who said, you know, we're, we're, really, we're really all, you know, trying to serve the same God. We're just on different paths. That's crazy talk. I'm just going to be honest with you. There's only one path. There's only one road. Jesus died to open that path up for us. And if it took his death to open it up, let's not, let's not begin believing some craziness that says, well, there are all roads lead there. No, it took his death to open up the one path, so let's follow the one path. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. Anyone left out of that? No one comes to the Father except through me, except on the path that I've created. He descended to us so that we could ascend with him. And please understand that Jesus is not simply our tour guide here. He's not a cab driver who creates an illusion of being one of us while he's really separate from the journey that we're on. No, he was all in for us. All in. And he calls us, this is the call of Christ on your life. He calls us to be all in. He calls us to follow him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength because that's what it takes to follow that path. If we look back to verses 11 through 13, we see that the Hebrew writer makes the strongest possible statements about the depth of Jesus' love. And in order to do that, to make that strong statement about Jesus' love, he uses the metaphor of family, a metaphor that most of us can get behind. Jesus is the one who sanctifies Those who are being sanctified are us believers, people he makes holy to serve God through him. And since God is the father of Jesus, he's also the father of the believers uh, he's called to sanctify and serve. And for that reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. That, to me, is an amazing thought. Jesus is not ashamed to call me his brother. What? What? He's not ashamed to call you his sister. When's the last time you just thought about that? Dwell on that for a good long week. I am a brother to Jesus Christ. He's not ashamed to claim me. And he's not ashamed to claim you. Family relationships in the first century were even more central And they were even more defining than family relationships are today. Can you imagine hearing that Jesus was not ashamed to identify with them as family? Can you imagine how that must have impacted those Christians? And how much it should impact us? It should be more than we can possibly comprehend to think that Jesus has called us brothers and sisters. Jesus knows us. Jesus claims us. Now, because he claims us as his kin, here's where it gets hard. Then we who claim God as our Father, we have a responsibility. You want to know what that responsibility is? We've got to claim each other. That means even when you drive me crazy, which is a pretty regular thing, I've got I've to claim you as brother because you know what? I drive Jesus crazy all the time and God crazy all the time because of the sin in my own life. That means even when we disagree. Are you hearing me tonight? I've got to claim you as brother. I've got to claim you as sister. That's not really the way it works, though, is it? When we disagree, we often feel like we have the right to cut fellowship. We have the right to throw you out with the bathwater, the proverbial baby with the bathwater. Does Jesus do that to us? When we get it all backwards, when we get it all messed up, does he say, yeah, sorry, no longer are you my brother? Does he do that? I sure hope not, or we're all in a world of hurt. No, he says, you're my brother, and I love you. You're family. I claim you as my own. Does this mean we just tolerate our differences and never study the Bible? Of course not. If you're hearing me say that, you're not hearing me at all. But what it does mean is that there are something that's more important than winning an argument, and that is family, the family of God. That's what I'm called to be a part of. 
and, and, and I don't care if you don't like your brothers or sisters. You have to claim them. You have to own them. You have to be a part of them. You have to be recognized together. That's what it's saying, if it's saying anything at all. And to support this point, the writer quotes Psalm 22, 22, and he uses Psalm 22, and he puts the words in Jesus' mouth himself. And if you know anything about Psalm 22, it is an absolutely amazing psalm. It is, to me, the, the, the critical psalm of the New Testament that Jesus alludes to when he's on the cross. When he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's crying out this very psalm. Psalm 22, it's incredible, and it begins with that cry, and from that dismal start all the way through verse 21, the forsaken one describes his peril, and he pleads for God to deliver him from that peril. But when we reach verse 22, everything changes, and the protest turns to praise in gratitude for the deliverance that God has given. And the implications of this psalm are huge, and I really want to talk more about that, but we're not talking about Psalms tonight, we're talking about Hebrews. And so we'll come back to that. But after that quote of Psalm twenty-two, twenty-two, 22, he then quotes Isaiah 8, 17 and Isaiah 8, 18. And in it, Jesus identifies, hear this now, Jesus identifies fellow humans, us, as his personal inheritance and reward from the Father. Think about that. Because Jesus was faithful in obedience completely, we, we are Jesus' reward. Some reward. He's getting the short end of that stick, isn't he? We are, are a part of the inheritance that Jesus gets. It's, it's incredible. The prospect of eternal companionship with all his brothers and sisters, that is why for joy set before him, he, he endured the cross and ultimately became obedient to the point of death. Man, dwell on these things, guys. This, this is so crucial to understanding who God is, but more importantly, understanding who we are. As we look at the end of this section of Scripture, from Hebrews 2, verses 14 through 18, uh, what it shows us is something that we know really, really well. The latest USA Today poll is out, one out of one die. <laughs> it, it, just, it shows us that. Every one of us experience human frailty. We get weaker. We, get, we, we don't get to keep the strength that we had when we were younger. And ultimately, all of us, unless the Lord comes first, are going to experience death. And Jesus accepted the same and his identification with us. Although tempted in every respect, Jesus never broke faith with the Father. And because he never sinned, death had no power over him. And listen to this is my favorite part of the whole lesson. I've been waiting to say this. When Jesus, oh, I love this. When Jesus enters the realm of the dead, he enters as death's invader. He enters as death's destroyer. He doesn't go into the realm of the dead as some kind of victim. He doesn't go in as some kind of captive. Far be it from that. Death had no claim on him. He walks into death and he snatches the keys from Satan. And he says, I'll be taking those from you now. I I I'll be the one who decides when the gates are open and when the gates are shut. And he triumphantly makes his exit out of death's door. Wow. That's the God we serve. That's the God who's on our side. That's the God who's for us. That's the God who loves us. And from the day Adam and Eve sinned, the devil has been using sin as, and the results of that sin as a way to intimidate us, to try to get us to not be what we're supposed to be and do what we're supposed to do. In that way, death became, as one commentator said, the henchman in the devil's service. But what Jesus' death does is he walks in and he disarms the devil. And he says, death no longer holds its former terror over the children of God. Jesus' victory over death even changed our vocabulary. You know, Jesus changes the calendar from A.D. to B.C. and all of that kind of stuff but it even changes our language 
Think about this for a second. Before Jesus died and rose again, the Greeks called the burial ground the necropolis. You know what necropolis means? The city of the dead. Ooh. After Jesus has died and raised from the dead, what do we call a burial place, a burial ground today? A cemetery. And a cemetery comes from the Greek word meaning a resting place, a sleeping place. Jesus changes everything. He changes our very vocabulary. He says, death, you don't get to do what you've always done. Death, you don't get to intimidate like you used to. Instead, for us who are followers of Jesus, death is, death is not the city of the dead. It's, it's a place where we get to go be with Jesus. Paul says in Philippians 1, verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And the only reason he can say that is because of what Jesus accomplishes for us. Amazing. So here's the point. Hebrews 2 closes by reminding us that in order to save us, Jesus had to be made like us in every single respect. And so as a man, he truly experienced temptation, sorrow, desire. And because of that, he's able to show mercy to you and to me, whom he represents as our high priest. As our representative, Jesus lives a life of faultless and loving obedience to the Father. And the point is this, Jesus remains wholly faithful to the Father while at the same time representing his people. And that's very, very important. He is the ideal high priest according to God's own standard. It was as high priest designated by God that Jesus made this atoning sacrifice, this propitiation for our sin. And as our author's later going to explain, it was by becoming a man and then becoming a faithful man that Jesus was able to make this atoning sacrifice, make this propitiation a reality. For the offering by which he accomplished this priestly function was in fact his own human and faithful and perfect life. The word propitiation only appears one other time in Scripture. Did you know that? In Luke chapter 18, interesting that this is the one other place that the word appears. It appears in that, that account of the Pharisee and the tax collector who come into the place of worship. And the Pharisee stands there. You remember the story. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I uh, give a tithe of everything I possess. I've got it all together. In fact, Lord, you're very lucky to have me in your service and in your kingdom. I'm not like this tax collector over here. I, I, I've got it all together. And the tax collector can't even lift his eyes into heaven, but says, Lord, be propitious to me because I'm a sinner. The tax collector begs Jesus to be propitious in the original sense of the word. Think about that. And isn't that what we should be begging God to do? This is our author's first explicit mention of Jesus as our high priest. Although he hinted at the role earlier in Hebrews 1.3, uh, he's calling it out clearly here. Jewish literature between the Testaments, between the end of Malachi and the beginning of Matthew, includes lots of references to both a priestly and a royal Messiah. Yet in all of this literature, no one ever suggests a priestly Messiah who offers himself as a sacrifice for our sins or who intercedes for his people in heaven. It's interesting. What Jesus came and did was never conceived by any scholar, by anyone of all times. And the ones that the prophets that God spoke through, I don't even think they fully grasped what Jesus was going to be and what Jesus was going to do. 
In all of literature, no one suggests that. These two great acts, high priest interceding for us, which sum up Jesus' ministry, were above and beyond the thoughts and the imaginations of people in that day. And because Jesus was genuinely tempted and truly suffered, he is now fully able to help his people who at any moment are suffering or being tempted. That's the point. Jesus, Jesus doesn't wag his head and say, Man, there but for the grace of God go I. No. Instead, he says, There because of the grace of God there I am for you. Amazing. Amazing love. How can it be that Jesus would die for us? Incredible thought. I hope that that will go with you this week. I hope that it will be something for you to dwell on, to meditate on. I hope that it will be something that will challenge your thinking and cause you to, to look at Jesus again and say, worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain for me we can pray for you if we can help you we invite you to come down here right now at this point while we stand and we sing this song and to praise you but i fall on my knees my spirit is willing but my flesh is so weak so light the fire in my soul and the flame make me whole